When I was peaceful, that I was able to hear the voice of the Lord. It's like Elijah, when Elijah goes up to the mountain and the Lord's not in the, in the earthquake or the wind, the fire, but the Lord is in, in the still, small, the silent voice, the silent whisper. And if you're discerning a vocation and you're all tense, begging God, give me the answer, give me the answer, you're not in a place to hear the, hear the answer. It's only when you're peaceful, it's only when you're still that you hear that whisper of the Lord. Hi Fatherly, welcome to Vokari. Hi Eleanor, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Very good, very good. So Father, did you always want to be a priest? Did I always want to be a priest? No, um, is, the, is the short answer. I first felt called to be a priest when I was 28 or 29. And before that, it was never in my thoughts. In fact, I, my, my desire really was for marriage and uh, family and, and a good career. So priesthood was never on the horizon. Wow, Father. So did you ever, ever have any girlfriends or <laughs> did you ever pursue marriage? This is not confession. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, I mean, I, uh, I was actually engaged for, for, for a while and um, discerning, seriously discerning marriage there. But it was it it was a relationship that um, that wasn't really going anywhere. It was never going to lead to marriage. So so I'd split up um, with my fiance quite a few months before I, um, I I felt the call to the priesthood. So if I would tell me about the moment where you got the call to be a priest. The moment I got the call was um, it was a stage in my life that I was. I was, I was struggling, but I didn't realize I was struggling because outwardly, everything in my life was going really well. So in my career, um, I'd, I'd, I was a chartered accountant and the company that I worked for, I'd just been promoted to be the finance director of the, of the company. And we were, we were working in London, out in Hong Kong, and I was the, at sort of 27, 28, I was the, the finance director of the whole operation. So I used to fly out to Hong Kong. I'd be working in London, all these places. And the, the salary was, was incredible. So outwardly, everything was going, going really well. But inwardly, although I didn't really realize it at the time, I was, I was struggling. I mean, as I said, I'd split up with, with the girl that I thought I was gonna marry. Uh, a few a few months earlier to that, and um, but also the job that I was doing was very sort of um, money focused. I felt like, in terms of what the the world was offering, I felt like I had I had everything. So I had I had the nice house, car, uh, the money, the career, um, but inwardly, I was I was broken. And I couldn't understand why. So my only response to that was to, to try and earn more money, to try and go to more parties, to try to visit Hong Kong more often or go on more holidays. And every time I did that, it just sent me down and down and down on this spiral of, of, of just really sort of searching, but searching in the wrong areas. Um, so that was the, um, the sort of where I was in my life and then I found myself on, on a bus, uh, on a pilgrimage in Bosnia-Herzegovina to a, a small village, it was now a big, big town actually, called Medjugorje. And the, how I got there, my, my parents had, had been a number of times to Medjugorje and I'd, I'd, seen, I'd seen a real change in them over, the, over a few years and a real sort of deepening of their faith in a very sort of natural way. And I think quietly, I must have been quite impressed by that. So after a few years, my mum said to me, would, would you like to come to Medjugorje? And uh, I think I said yes, but then quickly changed my mind. I thought it would be all, you know, the Bible bashers <laughs> will, be, will be in Medjugorje. So that's not for me. So I never went on that pilgrimage, but then having said no, something really sort of chewed away in my heart that I'd, I'd said no. And I felt for some reason that I'd, I'd said no to Mary and I knew that I had to go. So I decided to go and I went on this pilgrimage. I booked a pilgrimage 
the new year 2006. Um, so it was the end of 2005, the beginning of 2006, and I was on this bus. It was snowing, it was raining, it was dark, and we were praying this rosary on the bus to this small village called Medjugorje that seemed to be in the middle of nowhere. And I remember arriving in that village on the first day and looking around and thinking, there's hills and there's, there's a church. What on earth am I going to do here for a week? But then I found a little pub and I thought, well, that'll do. So I think <laughs> I, spent, I think I spent my first day in the pub. But something, something happened profoundly, uh, but very sort of slowly over that week on that pilgrimage. And all of the, all of the hurt that I'd, that I'd been feeling gradually just sort of evaporated. And I, for the first time, I think since going to secondary school, I, I, felt, I felt peaceful and, I, and joyful. I, I realized on that pilgrimage that I'd not, um, I'd not felt joy in, in a long time. And my, my career, my lifestyle, everything was sort of leading in this, this other direction where I think I was searching for joy. But I, but I was never finding it. And for that, it was the first time in years that I can say that I'd felt joyful. So all of that was sort of going on. And then towards the end of the pilgrimage, I remember I, I bought a, a painting and it was a painting of the face of Jesus crucified. And for some reason, looking back on it now, it was supernatural. As soon as I, paid for that painting and took it in my hands, it seemed like all of the grace that I'd received over the week just left me. And I felt so anxious and uh, deeply sort of troubled inside. And I'm looking at this picture of Jesus thinking, well, what, what's going on there? What's all that about? And all day long, that last, that near the end of that pilgrimage, I just walked around feeling so anxious. And I remember in the evening, it was dark and it was raining and I thought, I'm going to go to confession. And I had no intention of going to confession, but having bought this picture, I thought, well, maybe I can just get that grace back somehow by just confessing something. So I queued up for confession. And in that queue for confession, that was the moment when I just realized and just turned to God and I just said, you want me to be a priest. And I knew in that moment that God wanted me to be a priest. And it was, and it, that was this, I knew that that was the source of my anxiety, that, that God was sort of, God was doing something and he wanted to reveal something to me. And it was that he wanted me to be a priest. After my confession, um, turning to this priest and just saying, I've got this crazy idea, and I thought it was absolutely mad, because why, why would God want me to be a priest? I said to him, I think, I think God wants me to be a priest, but that's such a, such a bad idea, because all I want to do is to get married and have a family, and uh, I've got this good job, and all, all this sort of stuff going on. I remember the priest, he just turned to me, and he held out his hand, and he shook my hand, and he said, son, I was exactly the same as you. Mm. And in that moment, I thought, oh, you've sent, you've sent this priest and he's, he, shared, he had that same experience as me. And it was, a, it was a, I don't know how long the confession lasted. It could have been minutes, it could have been hours, but I came out of there completely transformed. And I remember um, coming back to, to work to this job as being the finance director of this company. Mm -hmm. And it was the new year, 2006. And I remember just sitting at my desk with my head in my hands thinking, I can't do this job anymore. It makes no sense to me. And, and that was the beginning of, of my struggle, my journey of discernment. Wow, Father, that's so beautiful. What would you say, so obviously you received your calling in Medjugorje. Yeah. How was it coming back then to England and how did you, how did you um, journey with your calling when you were in England? 
So my, my response at first was to try and, and reject it mm. and, and deny it and just convince myself that I'd made it up. Um, so I managed to do that for a few weeks, but, but something had changed and, and gradually over, I, I just felt this, this call to, to the priesthood and it was, it was always there, but it was deeply confused, confusing and, and, and painful actually. I, I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what to think. And in the end, I was really blessed that God gave me a spiritual director. And this was a priest who was, who was much older and wiser than me. And he, he helped me, he guided me through that journey. But I think in answer to that question about that time back in England, I'd really describe, so it was 18 months, I spent 18 months discerning my, uh, or it was 18 months from arriving back in England to entering the seminary. And that period, especially the beginning of that, was like, it was like a pendulum swinging. And one day, just be dreaming about the priesthood. And I just imagine myself being a priest and how beautiful that would be. And then the next day, I'd imagine myself being married and, and how beautiful that would be. And my heart was really swinging between the two and this pendulum was just, was, was quite sort of torturous actually, just swinging all the time between sort of those two beautiful vocations. Um, but over time, it settled and it gently settled over, after, over a period of about a year and it settled on the priesthood. Wow. That's amazing, Father. It's amazing how God works and fills you with peace when yeah. you know your vocation. So you obviously went to seminary. How yeah. was your experience of seminary? Sem seminary was great. So I did six years in, in seminary, two seminaries in England, then at Oscott College. Mm -hmm. And often I realised a lot of my conversations with my friends in the pub, watching the football, they would be quite superficial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were talking about superficial things, football, or, or whatever, and, and being in seminary was the first time that I'd sit down with men together and, and have deep conversations, mm. and, I, and I really appreciated that. Then we'd pray the rosary together, and just living amongst these young men, uh, discerning, studying, praying together, was, was a, an incredibly blessed time. It was a difficult time as well, because there's that inner struggle of, of discernment going on, and that sort of gradually sort of dying to yourself and, and becoming free. And that can be painful at times. Uh, but overall, it was a, a beautiful, precious time of my life. So my ordination, so, so as, a, as a, a priest, there's two ordinations. There's your ordination to become a deacon, mm -hmm. and then the following year, your ordination to, to the priesthood. And um, my, my ordination to the priesthood, it was a beautiful day um, in Sheffield at the cathedral. And I remember even, even, even before being ordained, still not, still not fully knowing if this is what God wants me to do. And I don't think you, you, you ever know because otherwise there's no room, there's no need for faith if you've got certainty. So even walking up that aisle was a real sort of act of faith. And um, I remember walking into St. Marie's Cathedral and there were two of us, myself and one of my best friends, Father Kieran Fletcher, being ordained together and we were processing up. And I remember as I walked into the cathedral, I just saw everybody who, who I love in this world, my, my family or my friends, all just turn and look at me. And um, I think I got a fly in my eye <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> yeah, so there were a few tears, but it, it was an incredibly graced and blessed moment. It's amazing. So obviously now you've been a priest for four years. Four years. And how are you finding it? What, was your, what would you say is your favourite thing about being a priest? My favourite thing about uh, being a priest, I think, I think just the variety. So I've, 
I've spent four years um, in a parish as a curate, so an assistant priest, and just the sheer variety of, of um, in, a, in a day you could, you could do a, a beautiful funeral, and then from the funeral you'd be straight into the primary school with all the little ones, and they're asking you lots of questions. And then somebody might come to see you for, for a confession or for some healing or prayers. And just in a, in a single day, you can just touch so many people in so many, so many different ways. Incredible blessings just in the variety of the priesthood. There's never a dull moment then. Sometimes there's <laughs> some dull moments, yeah. So obviously being a priest, like all vocations, yeah. uh, there'll be some struggles. Yeah. Would you like to share maybe some of those struggles? So struggles, there, there have been struggles, there, there are struggles. And I think the, um, the struggle really is, is, is the struggle of dying to, to myself and just, mm -hmm. just always following the Lord. And just, it's that constant, Laying down, laying down of my life, and just asking the Lord, well, what, what, what do you want me to do? And and the struggle is sometimes, you know, what, what He wants me to do. Sometimes I think, well, that's not what I want to do. But actually, in hindsight, it, it always is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like a sometimes I'm like a little child, and you know, the parents are sort of taking them along to give him something beautiful, but I'm sort of, you know, stomping my feet uh, with the Lord. But um, a pre there, was a, there was a holy priest and um, a lady apparently once said to him, she said, Father, are you happy as a priest? And apparently this priest looked at her really puzzled. And he said, he thought for a moment and he said to her, I didn't become a priest to be happy. He said, I became a priest to serve. And he said, happiness is the fruit of service. And that's, that's something that I, there's the wisdom in that really, really gets me through because when I'm, I realize that when I am happy, I'm happy when I'm being a priest, when I'm, um, when I'm anointing somebody as they're dying, I'm happy when I'm hearing that confession and somebody just laying down the burden. I'm happy when I'm stood at the altar at mass, when I'm preaching, when I'm in the school with the children, or just, just all of those different moments of, of being a priest, serving. And when, when I serve, I'm happy. And happiness is the fruit of service. I was speaking to um, a few priest friends recently and they said they really struggled with loneliness. Okay. Do you think, do you find that being a priest or? Sometimes, I, I, I mean, I have had, had some, some lonely moments, some lonely times and um, I can't deny that. Um, my, my response, I've realised that, that, that whenever, if I do feel lonely, I think that's a call to prayer. And what, that there's a danger that if you do feel lonely, that you, you, we want to escape into something. So, oh, I'll, I'll put a film on, or I'll have a drink, or I'll, I'll do this or that to sort of escape, to get out of the loneliness. But what I find is in any sort of times of loneliness now, I see that as a call to prayer. And when I pray, when I pray in those moments, I'm never lonely because I'm with God. And that, that's the difference between solitude and loneliness. Solitude is being alone, but being alone with God. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's how I uh, respond to those moments. Wow, that's beautiful. So what would you say to anyone who is discerning the priesthood and may be scared, they might think that it's their voice rather than God's, or to anyone, um, yeah, who you might be worried about that call, what would you say to them? Wow, I'd say just, just, just follow, because the, the plan that God has is, is incredible and it's awesome. And I could, I could never have imagined 
the, the blessings and graces and ministry that I have as a priest and the life that I'm leading now compared to that, that accountant um, 10 years ago, that, that was my will, that was my way. But this is God's way. And God's way is so, so blessed. And I'd say to anybody that, that sort of might feel that tug in their heart, just to, to seriously discern it because, um, because whatever God, God has got planned, whatever God has got planned is beautiful and perfect. And also just to, just to have a go. I mean, when, when you go into, say, if, if you do get to seminary, when you get into the seminary, you're not ordained in that moment. You're ordained six years later a priest. You're ordained five years later a deacon, six years later a priest. That's the point that you make your commitment, that you make your promise to the Lord. The rest of it is just discernment. And one of the fruits, one of the blessings of seminary, I think, is that people leave because it shows that the process is working. And I always think thanks be to God that they had the courage to, to come along and discern that vocation. So I'd just say, just have a go. Um, give it a try. Get a really good, well, pray for a good spiritual director, somebody that's going to help you along the path. And then also, if you can, go to, um, go to, go on retreats, go on pilgrimages, go to especially young adult events. In this country, we're blessed to have this great movement, Youth 2000, which is something I've been involved in for 10 years now. And it was through, through being at those Youth 2000 retreats that I really um, was helped in my discernment. It was actually at a Youth 2000 retreat that I finally made my, my commitment, my decision to go ahead to seminary. So I'd say, yeah, all, all, of, those, all of those things, and, and above all, to pray. Just to pray, but to pray in a way that, that is about listening. I remember when I was discerning, I had a real struggle, and I said this pendulum was swinging, and, and I remember saying to God, why won't you just show me whether you want me to be a priest? And it occurred to me, God's waited 28 years for me. Surely I can wait a few more months for him to reveal his plan. And I remember I got to the point where I was so tense and so frustrated. I remember saying to the Lord, I'm not even going to think about priesthood anymore. And by the grace of God, for about a month or two, it didn't enter my, my thoughts. But, that's, but then, then I, I became peaceful and it was when I was peaceful that I was able to hear the voice of the Lord. It's like Elijah, when Elijah goes up to the mountain and the Lord's not in the, in the earthquake or the wind, the fire, but the Lord is in, in the still, small, the silent voice, the silent whisper. And if you're discerning a vocation and you're all tense, begging God, give me the answer, give me the answer, you're not in a place to hear the, hear the answer. It's only when you're peaceful it's only when you're still that you hear that whisper of the Lord saying priesthood, marriage, religious life, whatever. So Father, obviously you had some great friends around you when you were discerning, but the Catholic faith is beautiful. We also have our friends in heaven and the saints. Um, who's your favourite saint? My favourite saint is Saint Therese of Lisieux. And um, Saint Therese, I think the saints choose us. I don't think we choose saints, I think the saints choose us. And when I was in seminary, um, I felt drawn to Saint Therese. And I remember um, one day I was in the chapel and, and I, I, was, I was finding it hard just uh, because I've got two brothers. I was finding it hard being in the seminary, just surrounded by all these men all the time. And I'm just crying out for a sister. And I remember saying to the Lord, could I please have Saint Therese as my sister? And I went back to my, I finished my prayer and I went back to my room and I turned my computer on and there was a, an email and it said, would anybody like a free ticket to Lisieux? So I said, of course. So I replied to this email, I think that's a great answer to my prayer. So I read St. Therese's um, story of a soul and I went on this beautiful pilgrimage to Lisieux and then right at the end of the pilgrimage, a lady came up to me who I'd not met before and she gave me a card and I had a photograph of St. Therese and, she, and it said on it, I am your sister and your friend 
Never will I sleep watching over you. So Saint Therese has watched over me now for all these years, and she's, she's, my, she's, she's not my saint, she's my sister. Wow, praise God. Praise God. Well, thank you, Father, for your vulnerability and your honesty and for sharing so beautifully about your vocation and be assured of all our prayers for you and your mission in student ministry in Sheffield. Thank you, Ellen. is an impressive enterprise. Using the modern means of communication brings to our world the gospel of Jesus Christ. May their work of evangelization through means of communication be a blessing for all. I commend to you the work and the message especially of Shalom World TV. Their mission is to be fruitful and blessed. They, in their own lives, as well as those to whom they proclaim the gospel. They are to have blessing. They are to know peace. And to all, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love, this day and forever. Amen. Shalom world, God's own channel.